Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily gathering as we learn and discuss different aspects of the COVID crisis, the health crisis, the financial crisis, and the racial inequality crisis. Today has been an amazing day for me. It's episode 127, and this morning I got to interview Christian Amanpour as part of the Tarakani Lecture Series on First Amendment Rights at the University of Rhode Island, hosted by Dean Jean, Jen Riley of the College of Arts and Sciences. We were live on Facebook and all the channels this morning, and then in this tonight we're going to be talking about the videos that we shot. We'll be playing some clips and you will get to meet Dean Jen Riley and Laurie White Tarakani as we replay highlights of the interview, as well as discuss the work of Laurie's late husband, Jim Tarakani, a pioneering investigative journalist who died in June 2019. Our guests will be with us in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, hello everyone. I'm Sri, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please hit share. Please tag someone you know who would benefit from this conversation. We are going to learn a lot, as we did this afternoon, and we're going to talk a little bit in more detail about the comments that Christian made. They were so important and so perfectly timed to everything that's going on in the world. First, let me thank my producers, Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon, and Rose Horowitz, Rose Horowitz 31, and tell you about the show. This is episode number 127. We've been live for 127 straight days, including weekends. As long as we're in lockdown in New York, we plan to do this. We've had a million plus viewers, 234 guests. We're very proud that 143 have been women. All 234 could have been women. 48 cities, 13 countries, 40 doctors and nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, professors, teachers, bike messengers, all kinds of folks have been on the show and I have learned from every one of them. We wanna thank our sponsors. We are very grateful to Muckrack Academy for allowing me to create Fundamentals of Social Media, a free certification course available to everyone. mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social, Share a photo of this or take a screenshot and tell your family and friends. 4,000 people have taken this course. Everybody will learn from it. It runs sort of like Netflix style, about two hours of content, but you can do it in two hours, two days, or two months. And people have been sharing their certificates, which has been awesome to see. One more show we want to tell you about, She's on Call. This is a new show that I'm co-executive producing with my friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean. They're surgeons in New York. And this time we're talking about leadership in the medical world. And we have two senior medical leaders joining them who happen to be women, Dr. Wendy Sinta and Dr. Tamara Fountain. So please join us Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. I will not be on camera. I'll be blissfully behind the scenes as we hear from Dr. Sujana, Dr. Marina, Dr. Wendy, and Dr. Tamara. Please join us Sundays at 11. She's on call. Follow on Twitter, on Facebook, and on. you'll also find them on Instagram. So please check them out at She's on Call. All right, now I'm gonna bring on stage our guests for tonight. These are the folks who helped put together what is really a life highlight for me, being able to interview Christian Amanpour and the two people who made that possible, Dean Jen Riley and Laurie White Tarakani, are both here. So let me say hi to them. Hello. Hey, Shri. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I know it's late for all of us. I believe Dean Jen is often uh, not known to be here uh, doing shows at 10 p.m. Is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> when you're up at 5 a.m., 10 p.m. seems very late. It, it, and it is late, and so that's why I'm super grateful you'll spend a few minutes with us. Uh, if sure. I want to start the way I start all our shows. How are you? How's your family? What's it been like through this pandemic? Lori, you want to go first? 
Nope. Well, I'll start. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, working uh, at the University of Rhode Island, it, it means that we're nonstop planning so that we can get a fall semester up and running and, and bring our students and our faculty and staff back to a place that we know that we're protecting their health and safety, but we're also able to pursue our mission, which is education and moving our students forward to their degrees. So that's been exciting. And at home, um, it's, you know, in, in some ways, it's been a break to work from home a little bit. Uh, cuts out that commute and that hour long drive and you get to see your, your dogs a little bit more. <laughs> That's so, so important as my wife will tell you. Let's go to Laurie. So um, yes, I have been working from home just like you all since March and I'm the president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. So he had been very busy during this time helping the business community deal with uh, the pandemic and stay in business and get the resources they need. So uh, yes, uh, my dining room has now become my television studio and I'm doing chamber TV. And it's been, um, it's been very rewarding to be able to provide the service. So, but doing well and like Jen, uh, enjoying time with uh, my cat as it, uh, as it were. So <laughs> thank God for the pets. Yes. Thank God for the pets. All right. So we're seeing on screen what we did today. I think we had a, it was an amazing day with thousands of people around the world watching at noon uh, when we got to talk to Christian. So let, let's have Jen uh, set this up for us. I'm going to call her Jen. She's Dean Jen Riley. I put on a jacket. We don't get a lot of deans on the show. Uh, so uh, Jen, will you tell us a little bit about the context of this and maybe back up a little bit, the College of Arts and Sciences, Harrington School, and then we'll play a clip here with Christian. So uh, the Terracani Lecture Series is coming out of the Harrington School of Communication and Media, which is housed underneath the College of Arts and Sciences at URI. Um, the Terracani Lecture Series came about out of a sad thing, which is we lost Jim Terracani in 2019. When he passed away, Lori and, his, and um, her family and friends came together and wanted to create a series and an endowment that would keep Jim's legacy for investigative journalism, going after the truth, being there to sustain our democracy through journalism and the First Amendment um, as a way to keep it going, uh, not just through URI, but in our state. And we're hopeful we're gonna be able to keep this conversation going nationally and internationally. So the series started this summer because we were unable due to COVID-19 to have our actual live inaugural event this past spring. Lori came up with this great idea of three different conversations this summer. We started with Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wadon. Fabulous conversation, more than a thousand people showed up. And then uh, today we were very fortunate that our own alum, Christiane Amapur, joined us for an hour um, to share her thoughts on journalism and what's going on in the country today, as well as the First Amendment. And then we'll finish up in August. We're going to be inviting local journalists in to talk about the journalism in the region, um, in New England, and, and what's going on in our own state of Rhode Island, and to bring that to our community as well. We're fortunate that uh, we have a great partner in Lori um, that has enabled us to, to do this. And then we hope that we'll have the inaugural Terracani face-to-face -face event in spring and we'll have to see how things unfold between now and then. Thank you. Uh, Laurie, your thoughts uh, about this morning and how that went? Well, it was great to uh, see Christiane again and um, she and Jim uh, have been have been friends for decades. And in fact, uh, Jim um, and she uh, worked together in the 1980s in Providence at WJR TV Channel 10. And uh, she was his intern and they began, um, you know, when she was at the university uh, studying journalism at the University of Rhode Island. Um, she would, had always shared with Jim that she wanted to be an international correspondent. So um, throughout the course of the interview, we talk a little bit about how uh, Jim mentored her during that period of time and the circumstances that led up to uh, her getting her first job at what was then a very new and novel 24-hour cable news network known as CNN. So that was back in the 1980s when the notion of 24-hour cable news was really very new. So she started off as a tape jockey and Jim knew that uh, with her 
um, expertise in foreign affairs and her multilingual abilities that uh, at some point, she would um, she would be she would jump out from uh, the crowd, and her new superiors uh, would see that she was um, a, a first class talent and be able to uh, utilize her in an on the air position. So we talked a little bit about that, but it's great to see her again. She is a great friend to the University of Rhode Island uh, with her own lecture series, which we all uh, found so fascinating and enjoyable and poignant and profound uh, last fall. And she uh, was able to spend some time with us um, after the lecture. And um, it was you know, amazing to, to see her. And I'm just sorry that um, like you and like all of us that she has not been able to get back on the road and to travel and to uh, bring her reporting live to various places because uh, she too is um, at home and she's in London doing her daily show. So we're gonna listen to a little bit. My first question to her was uh, how she's doing. So let's just hear what she had to say. Thank you every day, every night, depending on where we are in the world and see you bringing us insights, bringing us clarity at a time of great difficulty. What has it been like for you to deal with this pandemic and your team, you're producing shows remotely. Talk about that, please. Okay, I'm gonna say that here I am, what I say every night. I'm Christiana Moncou, working from home in London. You're seeing my studio, which is essentially um, part of my kitchen. Um, uh, and that's what it is. And we've been here now, I don't know how many weeks it is. Could it be 16? I, I don't know. Uh, a lot of weeks, since, since March 26 or something, we've been sitting here doing this job. And on the one hand, it has its limitations because it's different, definitely different for me. I'm used to mostly being face to face with the people I interview. Uh, and that hasn't been possible in this lockdown. So I am doing it via this kind of situation, um, often by camera, by Skype or other, you know, technical ways of reaching people in their homes or wherever they might be. In a way, that's been a little difficult, but in a way, it's also been quite revealing because A, people are at home and they are available for interviews. They have no more excuses to say, sorry, I can't make it, I can't do the travel, I can't. No, sorry, we come to you just with a little bit of technology. So we're getting a lot of, 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 of guests who um, we might not have as easily have brought onto the program uh, every night, so that's great. And, you know, it's it's been... Um, a gradual night by night um, evolution of this story because we've stuck mostly with COVID and of course with Black Lives Matter and the uprising in the United States for justice and uh, across the board, racial justice, economic justice uh, uh, and, and the rest, which has also come over here to the UK and also to other parts of Europe in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. So in that regard, it's been difficult, challenging, but we're still at it and we're still doing it. So, you know, I think we've been very useful in this moment. And I think that the, the most, or the very least we can expect to, to do and to be is useful to the public. All right, let's pause there. Jen, your thoughts on, on just that opening uh, remarks and uh, just reflect on having her as an alum, uh, what that has meant for the university. I mean, we're lucky to have Christiane, I mean, you can see it right there in that interview. She's she's always present, she's always real, she's telling you what she really thinks. Uh, she's been very generous with her time and what Lori mentioned, she came back last year, her, her lecture series that we've been doing for about eight to nine years now, she came and did it last year and she spent about two and a half days on campus. And her interactions with the students is what really moved you. She spent time with them, talked to them, mentored them, um, and really uh, shared with them her experiences that was transformative from them. So she's a very giving person. What I love too is, is what she talks about is, is that we need journalism today. Uh, this is something that I personally believe and it's also what we're tra striving to do in the Harrington School at URI is to create that next generation of journalists uh, to follow in the footsteps of Jen Terracani and Christiane Amapur because that's what's essential for us to keep our democracy going and keep open uh, communication and, and dissent going in our country. And she definitely remarked on that as well. Uh, I want uh, everyone to know that we have the full video on the Harrington channel. So just look up the Harrington School of 
communication and media. We also have a shortcut that you can see on screen, bit.ly slash Tarakani2, so that you can find it. But please go on to Facebook, go on to YouTube, and subscribe to the uh, Harrington School uh, channel so that you can uh, see this episode, see the episode that we did with Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn, and the upcoming episode we're going to do about local and regional journalism. Let's get Laurie's thoughts on what Christiane had to say, and then we'll listen to her on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Well, um, she I thought she was, she was bold, she was brilliant, and she talked about uh, in her opening question, um, the difference between uh, traditional journalism, legitimate journalism, where uh, journalists are, in her view, um, mandated and uh, today have a responsibility to be truthful, not neutral. And she explained a little bit about what she means by that. And that, of course, was uh, the theme that she brought forth during her lecture um, on campus last fall as well. So truthful, not neutral. I'm sure we will um, hear some clips from her where she describes, you know, specifically what that means. Um, but more to the point, um, she was talking about the complexity of issues today and how, you know, we as viewers, we as readers, we as citizens uh, also have a responsibility to understand uh, and understand the complete dimensions of the news that um, journalists are covering today, uh, news that is um, topical and important to follow, and to be able to do that in a way that synthesizes it uh, and allows us to think critically about what we hear. And she talked about the, the challenges of uh, masquerade journalism, which um, I thought was an incredibly important point uh, to bring out that um, a lot of times um, the public is not aware that folks that one might see um, on certain channels or, you know, news feeds, et cetera, uh, masquerading as journalists and that they are hyper-partisan um, paid actors, if you will. And um, the responsibility that we have as citizens and informed individuals to understand the difference between true time-tested journalism and that which is, um, is not that case. Thank you. Let's now listen to her talk about the First Amendment. First Amendment. You know, it is the example to the world. There is no other country that has a constitution that guarantees the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and that obviously informs our profession. Um, I'm in England. You know, yes, we have a very developed democracy, but we also we do not have a constitutional protection in that regard. And therefore, you know, while I may be British and also Iranian, I grew up in terms of my profession in the United States, learning all these lessons in the United States and carrying these lessons, these principles, these morals, these values uh, in my work around the world. So it is vital, it is absolutely vital that even under the most difficult of circumstances where we find ourselves right now under attack as American journalists or working for American organizations by the leadership of America. That is unacceptable. And we have to continue to fight against it. Because I might expect to be uh, have my First Amendment rights trim in countries which don't believe in the First Amendment and don't have a First Amendment, uh, whether it's in you know the dictatorships or the authoritarian regimes that I've spent my whole career covering. There is no protection for journalists anywhere in the world. Period, end of story. Either we are are shut down, either we are sent out of the country, or in the worst case scenario, we are wounded, jailed, or even killed. That is the, the, the life that we live trying to bring the truth in other parts of the world. So we do not accept it, and we do not expect it to be the case, uh, to face that, that kind of pressure and that kind of unconstitutional attack on our profession from within the United States itself, from within the leadership of the United States. So, you know, we have a double double fight on our hands, the fight to, to get the truth and the fight to, to, to you know, to, 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 keep, to keep the dogs off, so to speak. Okay, Jen, your thoughts. I, I think it, she captures very accurately for, you know, what we think of the First Amendment and why it's so valuable in the United States. Um, and we've seen it right now across the country, the the way people are coming out and 
able to voice their views and opinions about what's going on, about the politics, about things they agree with and disagree with. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the United States. And I think journalism, journalists across the country um, and journalists like Christian are helping that voice uh, stay present and, and be heard for us. Thank you. I know we, we promised to let you go in a couple of minutes, so I'll uh, come back to Laurie. But first, Jen, if you would tell us a little bit about what's, uh, how you're preparing for the fall and how you're thinking about it. Uh, I know the uh, Trump administ administration dropped their uh, rule to uh, really f try to force universities to, uh, you know, in, in a way that they may not have been ready, uh, dealing with international students. So talk a little bit, a little bit about that and then we'll let you go. So URI is like a lot of uh, universities in the, in the country where we're making active plans to, to deal with COVID-19. The health and safety of our faculty and staff and our students are at the forefront. Uh, we're, we're really adjusting our schedule right now. We're going to have a mix, again, like many other institutions, uh, really a mix of some face-to-face -face classes for those things we really want face-to-face. -face. I think of my fine arts classes We'll still be doing our chemistry labs, but with nine people instead of 18. Um, and then we have blended classes where we know our students will be able to come once a week and interact with our faculty. And then we'll have some online classes. So it'll give our students a, a good mix. It'll enable them to engage with their peers. Um, and, and we're gonna keep doing the work that we do. One of the things I say to my students when they come and ask me what we should be doing next year is stay on track to your degree. Uh, the best thing we can do right now is, is, is keep you on track for your degree, prepare you, and the world is going to open up again. We are going to get through COVID-19, and we want our URI students ready to step into that world. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Laurie, uh, anything you'd like to say to Jen before we say goodnight to her? Um, I'm so proud of uh, the work that the Harrington School of uh, journalism and media and communications is doing to train the next generation of responsible journalists. And what I was really thrilled and excited about today was um, uh, half a dozen students who took the time to record short videos to talk about and to ask questions of Christian and to reflect on certain elements of the First Amendment and attributes that they see as um, um, pillars of journalistic integrity. So the students were so bright and um, Christiane was, you know, especially uh, thrilled to see um, the number of young women um, that are interested in, in pursuing a career and a profession in the international journalism sphere. Uh, so she was giving them shout outs and, um, you know, together with um, Dean Riley, we were just, you know, thrilled to be able to um, bring this kind of discussion and involve uh, the students at the University of Rhode Island in what we're doing this summer. That's great. Well, uh, uh, Jen Riley, thank you so much for being here. We'll let you go so that you can uh, get up again at five in the morning. It's incredible. Uh, Happy to do it, Shri. Thanks, Lori. Enjoy. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, she's terrific, and it's been a real pleasure to get to know her and to work with your 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 team and everybody who has come together to celebrate uh, Jim's legacy. And we'll uh, now listen to a little bit more. And uh, you're you're feeling okay so late at night? Absolutely, this is great. This is uh, it's a it's a surreal time, and I'm just um, so so thrilled and pleased and proud. And I just want to thank. Um, all of my friends and colleagues and, and donors to the Terracani Lecture Series Fund um, to make this programming possible. And um, it's just such a, a sweet and bittersweet moment for me. Yeah, tell us a little bit about, uh, about Jim. And uh, I know we talked at length when we did the debrief of the Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn show uh, uh, exactly a month ago, so people can find it in our archives. That was episode 97. Here we are, episode <laughs> 127, 30 days later. It feels like things have not just not become better in most of America, it's become worse, if that's possible, in terms of the pandemic. But in the Northeast, and I believe Rhode Island's doing well, uh, or at least relatively well, and uh, Christian gave a shout out to Rhode Island, how it's all been handled. Right, so um, just like um, what you're experiencing in uh, New York Street, the, um, the Northeast was hit very hard in the spring, late spring, March, April, May. 
Um, we peaked here in Rhode Island in terms of numbers of cases and deaths uh, around uh, April 23rd, 24th, 25th in that area. Um, but we were very quick under the leadership of uh, Governor Gina Raimondo to um, shut the state down essentially and uh, stay at home orders um, for um, the vast majority of, of workers. And a great deal of testing um, was conducted during that period of time and very um, you know, strict adherence to those guidelines. And uh, the governor is indefatigable in her ability to reach out all across this country to get resources. And back at, um, at the beginning, it was hard to fathom as citizens that we as a country had a shortage of PPE and the like and ventilators and it was um, you know a, a crazy thing to to just behold but uh, she is uh, an individual who comes from a business background a former venture capitalist she has um, colleagues and business um, um, acquaintances and and the like uh, with uh, people all across this country all across the world and um, she was relentless on the phone and in, in seeking uh, PPE and other things that uh, we needed here in our state to be able to effectively combat the virus. So we're in uh, actually in stage three of the reopening, um, but we're proceeding very cautiously, very, very, very cautiously. And, um, you know, trying to, again, like in other places across the country, demonstrate and to reinforce um, the importance of social distancing and the importance of mask wearing and contact tracing and the like. So she's done an outstanding job uh, in terms of the numbers of Rhode Islanders on a percentage basis that have been tested and, and retested. So uh, we're doing well, but as she said today, she said, look, you know, we're not even halfway through this and we have to brace ourselves for the fall and the potential of a resurgence here, like you're seeing uh, in other places, but um, it's a it's a touch and go situation. But but we're we're doing as well as can be expected under her leadership. Well, I should uh, I should point out that we're talking about a female leadership uh, bonus that's happening in other countries. People talk about that, right? They've said right. New Zealand is right. held up, but we see Rhode Island is benefiting from it. Uh, right. The, uh, we, we, we met Dean Jen Riley, who's a leader. You're a leader of the Providence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, tell us why do you think it is that this is, it's during this pandemic that suddenly people are waking up to the, the kind of power of female leadership? Yeah, I was, um, I was thinking about that and I did follow those stories about countries across this world that in fact are, are handling the virus in ways that are um, superior, if you will, or much more effective and led by uh, women leaders. And I was pondering, you know, why that might be. But um, I think the, you know, women approach problem solving perhaps in a, in a more um, empathetic and direct and, um, you know, be able in, are able to connect with people um, in a much more precise and um, perfect, per perhaps emotionally effective way. Um, and I see that. And this, on top of everything else, on top of fighting the virus, um, you know, from a scientific point of view, a lot of what we need to be able to instill uh, to the public and to those that we serve is, is a communications message, if you will, right, Sri? And this is all about persuasion and helping people to understand that this is a very serious situation grounded in science, grounded in medicine, and that we, in essence, have the, the power within our own hands to be able to hopefully mitigate some of the, the most dire and pressing circumstances by, in fact, um, leading um, and, and being able to follow the rules and the, um, the requirements that, the, that those that are experts in this field, and we've talked a lot about it, I've listened a lot about it, I've learned so much from your show and all the experts over the course of these last 167 um, shows that you've been doing three on a nightly basis, but it's a communication strategy. It is be able, it's it's the, the underpinnings that are be able to get to people and to un help them understand 
that um, that these are serious matters that need to be paid attention to, and and perhaps women are are better communicators um, in that respect, especially in an emergency. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't what, agree more. <laughs> what do you What do you think? What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it has a lot to do with uh, what you were describing, the the power of uh, empathy, the power of listening, and uh, and and also being open minded, right? Like. Uh, there is a thing as a white male privilege and confidence and uh, male confidence. So it's not just white men, but men everywhere who, uh, you know, the, the, the same gender that doesn't ask for directions in a car, suddenly put them in charge of a country. Maybe they won't ask for as many directions. You know, they think they know just because luck and circumstance and privileges put them in power doesn't mean that you have therefore some special God-given right to rule or to rule well uh, it won't happen automatically and we're we're paying the price here in this country of course uh, it's very easy to say about the president but we're also seeing at the go at the governor's level what it means when you saw the horrifying story that in one of the states where they had in georgia where they had uh, individual towns and cities had mask mandates not only did the governor not have a mask mandate, he had the opposite saying you cannot have a mask mandate. So overturning mask mandates at the height of a pandemic, it is just unfathomable that that would be possible in any other country in the world at any other time, except this moment and everything that's here in this country. So uh, don't get me started is what I would like to say. <laughs> and let's go back to Christian and listen to her talk about uh, in, in here, you're about to hear, uh, uh, let me just tell everyone who's just tuned in and not sure exactly what's going on. Uh, we, uh, Laurie and I and Dean Jen Riley interviewed Christiane Amanpour this morning. She is an alum of the University of Rhode Island and she was speaking at the Tarek Khani lecture series on first amendment rights. And that uh, is put together by the Harrington School at the University of Rhode Island and Laurie Tarakani, who's here with me, she's Laurie White Tarakani. The uh, her late husband Jim Tarakani was a pioneering advocate uh, for great journalism and a great investigative journalist himself. And Laurie in, uh, helped put together this series. And I have the honor of partnering to put together the show and to interview Christian as we did one month ago. Cheryl Wu Dunn and Nick Kristoff. So we're playing clips here, but you can watch the entire thing if you go online to bit.ly slash Tarakani2 or just go to the Harrington School of Communication and Media on Facebook and on YouTube. You can find it there and, uh, and you can watch the entire thing. You can see the link is written right on the screen right now. But now we're going to uh, hear from Christian again, and this time, She's going to talk about fake news and neutrality and whether journalists should, in fact, be neutral. So let's hear her thoughts. Yes, but I refuse. I won't even repeat those slogans. I simply will not go there. And I will write my own narrative. And we should all write our own narrative, which is the narrative of truth. And we do not repeat. I won't even use the word F-A, you know, and then E uh, to describe news. I won't even use M-S-M, uh, you know, no. Really? no. We are journalists. We have one mission, and that's the truth. And we have to
much to every accusation, every insult. The best way to react is to continue telling the truth, to continue calling out lies, and to continue to, um, you know, to, 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 to report in an objective, truthful fashion for journalists anywhere in the world. Period. End of story. Either we are, are shut down, either we are sent out of the country, or in the worst case scenario, we are wounded, jailed, or even killed. That is the, the, the life that we live trying to bring the truth in other parts of the world. So we do not accept it, and we do not expect it to be the case, uh, to face that kind of pressure and that kind of unconstitutional attack on our profession from within the United States itself, from within the leadership of the United States. So, you know, we have a double double fight on our hands, the fight to, to get the truth and the fight to, to, to you know, to, 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 keep, to keep the dogs off, so to speak. I understand that. And I was tempted to say, welcome, I'd like to invite and bring to you an enemy of the people, because that's what we've been labeled, haven't we, as journalists? Yes, but I refuse. I won't even repeat those slogans. I Let's, uh, that, was, that was a moment where Christian was correcting me, saying that uh, we shouldn't even say those terms. Laurie, hi, I think we're back, and I think I see you. You're, you're good. Laurie, can you hear me? Great. Uh, I think you have to... Uh, just let's see if we can get your microphone working. We've been having some audio issues. Can you hear me? But I can't hear you. So maybe we'll have you just uh, leave and come back. Let's see if that works. Okay. Uh, so folks, we're listening to this interview with uh, Christian Amanpour that I uh, hosted this, af uh, this afternoon with Laurie. And it was just, as I said, a life highlight to hear her and to uh, have her uh, talk to us about various aspects of the crisis. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit and we're going to pick this up at another point in the conversation. Governor Raimondo of, of the state of Rhode Island. You know, this was just before we all went into lockdown and I got a fantastic interview in which she was very, very open and direct telling me what was happening in Rhode Island, where the first cases of infection were coming. She told me the truth of what was going on in that she noticed and Rhode Island noticed that the first infections from COVID were from Europe. They came apparently from Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And it was because of a school trip that had gone abroad and had come back with this disease. And she was very honest about it. No dissembling, no trying to you know, brush it off or whatever. And look where Rhode Island is today, doing one of the best in, um, in, uh, in, in coping with this and emerging from it. My view is that the truth is important, not just as a principle, but because it is fundamental to actually governance as well as, as, well as journalism, to good governance. And that interview, I remember watching it live and thinking that this is a great interview. I wonder if we will be able to continue to have conversations like this with governors. And the answer has been, sadly, for the most part, no. And governors and the federal leadership has resulted in the situation we're in now. Before we take audience questions, I did want to frame the title of this conversation, Truthful, Not Neutral in a Time of Dissent. You know that people have criticized journalists and others for telling the truth. How do you defend that? How do you frame it? And I love your idea of not even using the word F-A-K-E and that, that word after that, or even spelling out MSM, because you think that has defined the problem in a way that isn't even a problem, and they've taken control. Is that right? That is right. I mean, in the end, and, and we're learning that very much in the Black Lives Matter moment right now. Um, obviously, this this has been going on for a long time. But the United States and the world has been now forced to pay attention to Black Lives mattering in the United States, and it was a sacrifice. I don't even know whether that's the right word, but maybe he will be a martyr for for justice and for and for reparations and for rest, rest, restoration of some kind of of truth and. And, and dignity and justice uh, amongst all people. I'm obviously talking about George Floyd and the tragic killing um, at, the end of, at the end of May. But what I think is that, you know, those who would do us harm have sought to, to control the narrative and to frame the narrative and to label. And if we fall into that, then we are part of the problem. If we do not fall into that and stay, you know, true to our mission, to our profession, 
then we can be part of the solution. Sometimes I think we, uh, we tend to react too much to every accusation, every insult. The best way to react is to continue telling the truth, to continue calling out lies, and to continue to, um, you know, to, 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 to report in an objective, truthful fashion, not in a neutral fashion, which most people consider neutrality to, to mean equivalence. And when there is no equivalence, that forces people to draw false equivalence. And that is what is wrong with any any kind of endeavor that tries to draw a false equivalence where it doesn't exist, whether it's false moral equivalence, whether it's false uh, factual equivalence. All right, we're going to pause there and let me see if we can get Laurie on the show. Hi, Laurie. I can hear so, you, so I, I can't I can hear, hear you, but there's a little, little bit of that. Yeah. All right, All right so. so Tell us, Tell us what, what you were. Um, well, what what I was um, what I was amazed at was the notion of um, you know the the false moral equivalence where she talks about balancing both sides. And early on in her career, she talked about um, you know when journalism was the fundamentals were, you know, he said, she said, back and forth, back and forth, and presenting, um, quote unquote, both sides of the story. But in today's complex world, what she's reinforcing here is the responsibility of the journalists to really understand what they're reporting. And to, again, to not treat each each side, each opposing side, and this came out of her work in Sarajevo uh, with ethnic cleansing, that not every uh, side of the story is deserves or um, should in fact receive the same treatment if in fact the journalist telling the story really understands what's happening on the ground. So the back and forth of that, um, she believes creates a, a, a false a false imperative, if you will, uh, and that's where she gets this notion of truthful, not neutral, and using the ability of storytelling and fact checking and insights, critical insights, to be able to um, put forth stories that in fact um, make a difference and um, are relevant and also um, are have the ability to to change the course of human history. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, let's do our global tour as uh, people have been watching. They've been very patient. We haven't come to them in a while. So let's start with Jonathan watching from Union Square. Hi, Jonathan. Always great to have you and have you here. I'm going to give uh, Laurie a moment if she wants to uh, fix her audio. If she'd like to do that, she can. And Jonathan's watching from Union Square. Uh, Inji says, nice. Thank you. And Fernando says, greetings from Los Angeles, California. Always great to have LA in the house. And Fernando and I have been talking about doing a show together. We have all kinds of folks coming in. Uh, our friend Rose Horowitz was one of our producers, one of our two producers who make the show possible. Vandana Menon and Rose Horowitz, please follow them on Twitter, Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana underscore Menon. We're also joined by Apollo from Las Vegas. So good to be in the light, he says. And I want to tell you that we have a surprise for all of you who've been watching for a long time. Tomorrow's topic is uh, about the city that our friend Apollo is in right now. And let me show you what I mean and what is going to happen tomorrow. So tomorrow, the episode is about life under COVID in Vegas. And our guests are Terry Ann Thompson, former director of the Knight Badgett Program in Business and Economics Journalism at Columbia University a retired uh, New Yorker, and Yancy Jones, who is joining us, a mental health advocate. And that, by the way, is Apollo, who joins us every day, who just had a comment as well. So they'll be here tomorrow, Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Please join us, 6 p.m. in Vegas. And that's Friday night or, sa or, or uh, Saturday morning at 6.30. Uh, uh, please do join us. We'd love to see you and have you here with us. Let's keep going with the comments and great to have Apollo here tonight as well. And uh, Apollo is watching from Vegas, as he says. And he says he already took my course. I'm glad he did. Lori's watching from Dobbs Ferry and uh, lots of people commenting. 
And Matt Foley says the DNC is petitioning the debate moderators to allow Jill Biden on stage with Joe. Um, oh, this is, I'm sorry, that's on me. I read that thinking it's a normal post, but obviously that was a troll. I wasn't reading it in advance. And this is why you need moderators uh, on the comment. So that's on me, my bad. I wasn't uh, paying attention. So this is where when people are having a nice normal conversation, somebody jumps in there just to make trouble. So Matt Foley, you are uh, now banned. Oops. Oops. Uh, you are now banned from this show, Matt. Uh, uh, Lori's audio I think is working. We'll, we'll test her out one time here. Let's bring her on. I think I'm back. You're back. You're I back. Think, I think when I speak, when I there speak, is, there is a, so I, I will try to, we'll do this. When I speak, I will mute you. And then when you speak, I will just make sure that you're, you're talking. So we'll try to make that work. So you'll just follow along. So uh, you, you, you may have caught right there that uh, somebody going into a completely normal conversation and injecting the trollisms and the trolling nature of of this, uh, it is so frustrating to deal with that. Yeah, so, um, you know, that unfortunately is an example of what she was talking about with uh, masquerading and um, people who um, who don't, in fact, um, represent a, a, a news organization that is traditional and legitimate. And she was outlining the various news sites that she believes um, that people should turn to, to in fact, um, uh, be able to um, identify and to follow news from reporters and news sources that are in fact legitimate. And that was one of the things that Jim always, that Jim always talked about was the responsibility that's on us as people, as viewers, as li listeners, as readers, uh, to be able to and to have a responsibility to to um, educate ourselves on these kinds of things. So I think when we see when we see trolls, when we when we see things like this, that we, you know, that we have we've sufficiently educated our own selves so that we're able to you know brush it off and and to keep and to keep moving forward and. Um, and to, to see it for exactly what it is. So uh, I wouldn't get too worked up over it because, hey, you know, it's a fact of, it's a fact of life today and the, the social media world that we're living in now is, you know, in some respects uh, a double-edged sword. So you have to be really careful uh, which, which sites you follow, uh, which, who, who you follow, which individuals and how to protect your own feeds and to be able to, to see through um, one in fact uh, may not be true and, and legitimate. And the other thing um, that Jim always talked about was was the need to and the responsibility to um, compare news sources, if you will. So being able to be an informed citizen and, and take into account various um, news organizations and be you can get a, a full sampling of of um, reporting and perspectives so that you can come out with a balanced point of view. So, you know, don't just stick to, to one news source. In fact, she, you know, she talked about, you know, various newspapers, various um, uh, legitimate 24-hour um, cable news channels. She talked about NPR, where she has her program. She talked about various radio, um, wire services, uh, magazines that have true... Um, um, you know, long form content uh, that's important to get for the purposes of the nuance of it. And uh, although Jim was in television news, uh, where the, um, the, the ability to cover things in, in depth is, is sometimes, you know, challenging given the nature of the medium, which is, you know, very short stories um, and if even you know in the days of um, you know when he was on television if they gave him five minutes for a big expository news piece that was a big deal you know five minutes but if you um, but you can't survive on a constant diet of television news uh, he would always say and that's why um, it's important to you know read um, very 
uh, long form articles, whether they be opinion pieces that you would read in, um, you know, Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, New York Times, etc., but also magazines that have um, serious content that um, really probes in a way that you're not going to get on um, a broadcast a broadcast piece, you know, just due to the to the nature of the the medium itself. So. Um, that's a, a long-winded way of saying, you know, don't just rely on any one news source. And it's important that we have, um, you know, a full, the full dimension on, on uh, available to us at all times. And, you know, that's kind of what I do. I, I make sure that I have um, subscriptions to various um, national, international um, sites that I can uh, continue to, to look at and to reflect on and to see uh, what's happening not just in this country but around the world as well thank you uh we are now going to see another clip with, from christian's show so everyone who's watching right now uh we it, it's been a long day i think for all of us uh you know it's hard to imagine in another any other summer july is very quiet in in, in America, and suddenly we have a show. Uh, we're just, I've had a full business day today, and here we are at 10 p.m., and the fact that I could get Laurie to join me in this conversation, I think, tells you about what COVID has done to us. People are around and people do have time, but they're very generous, as Laurie is, to be with us so late at night. Uh, we've got comments coming in from all over. Here's Laura, another Laurie. Laurie says, uh, looking forward to watching the interview later on the Harrington School Channel. I worked at CNN, the New York Bureau, in the late 80s when she, uh, when uh, Christiane was becoming a full-scale international reporter. As a Chiron operator, had to type out her name correctly. That's right, a name that no one had heard of, unusual name, unusual accent that she had for the American ear. And here she is, you know, global superstar and someone who so many people looked up to and look up to today. We had someone from Seoul saying that he, she's been, her dream is to be uh, a, um, you know, to be Christian Amanpour. So let me bring uh, Lori back in here as we uh, go in and watch another clip uh, from the interview with Christian. And here uh, she's going to give some uh, tips about journalism and what journalists, young journalists, should uh, can and should look for. So let's uh, let's go to that. And uh, after that, I'll come back to Lori for some comments, and then we'll start to wind up. Remember, you can see the entire video at bitly slash tarakani2, bit.ly slash tarakani2. So now let's play the video. And I'm going to call for it, and here we go. You are I-84, she says that. Oh, thank you, Christian. You are my hero. Stay safe. You are I-84, broadcast and print journalism. And we have many other folks who've, who were sending us their greetings, so especially to the alumni. We are so happy to hear from you. Please keep sharing and tagging your comments and posting your questions. We have about 20 minutes left with Christian now. And uh, we have a question for you about the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, as you've described it. Uh, apply the the, the lens that we've been talking about, you know, uh, that we want to be truthful as we cover it. What are some tips that you would have? You give us a way you would do it, but what are some other things you wish more journalists would do? Well, I think the journalists would be doing a very good job, to be honest with you. They've been resisting the uh, effort to, to silo them or to, again, push them into political corners. And I think most journalists have been, or most journalism have been doing a very, very good job. Let's not forget that when we talk about bias and politicization, there are organizations in the United States, and sadly increasingly around the world, that are overtly political masquerading as journalists. They are political arms of a political party masquerading as journalists. So that's, that's one thing that we have to accept. And that's very true. On social media, there are increasing, look at the latest Neiman lab uh, findings. There are, uh, you know, hyper-partisan, you know, centers that masquerade as journalism. And we have to be very careful on, on, our, on our alert for that. Um, so I just think that uh, we, we really need to, you know, keep telling the story as it is, understand and go to those people who are living this experience to hear their experience, where the, the, the needle has been pointed and where it needs to come to. And, and you know, also 
question our own organizations, our own universities, our own corporations, our own, uh, I don't know, culture, our own TV and, and movies, how many uh, black people, people of color, native people, how many are actually not just in front, but behind the scenes, how many are able to shape the narrative or shape the direction of a bank, a corporation, uh, uh, a, a university, a school, or whatever it might be, a hospital, science, we really have to understand. And I feel like, you know, this is a fight certainly that, um, that blacks in America have been fighting for years and years, 400 years. It is time already. Women have been fighting this fight for a long time as well. You know, we're all in this fight for equality and justice, and we cannot do it alone. Women can't do it without men. The black community can't do it without the entire community. This is something that we have to get a grip with and not see it, you know, as, as something scary or a war that has to be, you know, dealt with. You know, this is something that we need to absolutely come together and redress right now because the time is now, the opportunity is there. Let's let's jump on it and see if we can create a better world. I mean, everybody's been talking about build back better, right? Build back better out of this COVID pandemic. Now we can say build back out of this um out, out of the uh, George Floyd's killing, but we have to be serious about it. It can't just be lip service. It can't just be hashtags. It can't just be clicktivism. It has to take powerful people opening the pipeline and agreeing to give up some privilege. Sorry, give up some privilege. And this line that keeps, you know, keeps coming back to me over and over again. I don't know who said it first, but for the privileged, equality looks like oppression. And that we have to be very clear about. So let me pause there and uh, let me bring back uh, Laurie as we were talking earlier. This is Laurie White Tarakani. You saw the sign, the Tarakani lectures on the First Amendment. Uh, first, uh, Laurie, if you can reflect a little bit on what you heard there and also tell us why you were driven to put this series together uh, and a little bit more about Jim and his legacy. Sure. Um... Well, um, Jim, well, first of all, let me just say that I was a student at the University of Rhode Island School of Journalism with Christian Amanpour, and I haven't talked about that um, yet tonight, but that's a, a, a different uh, aspect of her personality that I wanted to, to bring out and uh, share with you. So just think about, you know, back in the, you know, I graduated as a journalism student um, at the university in 1981. And um, right around that time, uh, Christiane had come to the United States to uh, begin her own studies in journalism, and she uh, happened to choose the University of Rhode Island. So uh, we were in some of the same classes together. And, you know, bear in mind, this is 1980 or so. And um, the degree to which she was such a brilliant student and the degree to which she uh, was so prescient about everything uh, in the world and her facility to be able to understand dictatorships and international politics and foreign affairs at um, you know such a young age and I um, you know I, I was nowhere near being in her league in terms of the understanding of of the you know being a global citizen and, uh, at that age uh, but she in fact was and you could just tell uh, right from the get-go um, what a brilliant mind she had and uh, the degree to which you knew that she was going to uh, excel and succeed and and become who, who she is today so I, I think back on those days when we were on campus and um, little did I know that, you know, fast forward all these years from, you know, 1980, here we are in 2020, um, thinking that I would be having this conversation uh, with her and with you and your viewers all over the globe about Christiane Amanpour when in fact we sat side by side at this, uh, at this, in this classroom. Um, and she was just a remarkable, a remarkable person. But she went on to, um, to um, get an internship at WJAR, as I talked about, and um, 
And together, you know, Jim and Christian covered a lot of stories, um, you know, back in the day when investigative journalism was just beginning to take off in the aftermath of Watergate. So they, um, they spent some time together and they both at the end of, uh, you know, sort of as the decades passed, they, um, they, they kept in great touch and they um, shared experiences with one another. But uh, she had said to Jim that, you know, her dream was to be an international correspondent and, uh, and she wanted to be able to, to break into the business. And uh, so over the years, um, he had encouraged her to, you know, pursue, pursue uh, an early job at CNN when it was in fact an unknown network. And she became, uh, she quickly was, um, you know, in this, and your, one of your viewers, uh, Lori talked about working at CNN and she was the Chiron operator. And those are the, you know, the words underneath the screen. Uh, but th that's a analogous to the type of job that Christian, um, you know, started with as behind the scenes and just taking in satellite feeds. And if you think about it, satellite feeds of international news, that was actually, you know, a big thing back then, you know, being able to record it onto to videotape and all of these things were, were very new. But that was her first job as a, as a tape jockey and just, um, you know, behind the scenes and, you know, getting it done in a way that was um, uh, performing a very important role, but certainly not the um, the expository journalism that she uh, eventually would would become. So it, it's it's really uh, it's really cool to be able to see her uh, talk about those days, those early days, and and to inspire the students at the um, that came out and were part of today's lecture series. So that was really. You know what I what I'm trying to accomplish uh, with the lecture series because uh, the First Amendment and the rights of the of the news media to protect sources. My husband was in home confinement for four months for failing uh, to um, comply with a federal judge's order to uh, reveal a source in a city hall corruption case, which ultimately resulted in. Um, um, a series of imprisonments by political figures that were taking bribes and the like, but uh, but for the fact that he had had a heart transplant in 1996, he in fact would have been uh, sent to jail for um, failing to um, to uh, turn over and identify this source. And he did absolutely nothing wrong by putting his undercover videotape on the air. There was absolutely uh, nothing that was illegal about that, but simply um, in the, the course of law enforcement, this desire from the federal judiciary to uh, compel Jim to um, reveal his source, which he did not. Uh, so for that, uh, just for doing his job, um, he had to endure all of, um, you know, all of this, all of these legal challenges and setbacks. And at the time, um, his station was um, Channel 10 WJR TV was owned by General Electric, and as such, um, they were very committed to the uh, First Amendment and to the role of journalism. And they had significant resources in order to pay um, over a hundred thousand dollars in fines and significant legal bills in order to um, fight this in a way that was precedent setting. Precedent setting. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things that I do worry about uh, going forward as, um, you know, small daily newspapers and the like um, are struggling in the aftermath of the pandemic, in the aftermath of the consolidation of various media, um, that we really need all of these media outlets, as we were talking about just a few minutes ago, to uh, report on everything from what's happening uh, before the local school committee or a police department or city hall, everything you know from the very hyper local level all the way up to you know what Christiana is talking about in in covering various dictatorships around the world and the various atrocities that she unfortunately has um, been witness to, uh, but the the need to uh, for the citizenry to understand that traditional journalism, real journalism, um, journalism that is not uh, masquerading as political pundit punditry, 
uh, as Christiane pointed out, and um, paid hyperpartisanship, that we need to be able to preserve um, the role of, of the journalist to be able to report the truth and to have a situation where they can protect their sources for um, the reporting of news that would otherwise go undetected, unreported. And people need to understand the difference between um, journalism that works in that respect and, and uh, people who are, um, are really not doing journalism. So we need to support local newspapers. We need to support local journalists because all of that is going to keep these newspapers in business. And we need, we need a proliferation in different points of view. And but for the fact that Jim worked for a very large organization that had the resources to be able to say, you know what, we're going to take this on. We're going to take this on as a fight because um, journalism is the only profession that's specifically called out in the Constitution. So the First Amendment, within the First Amendment, the five freedoms, if you will, specifically calls out the rights of news gatherers. Uh, to protect their, to, to express their point of view as part of the First Amendment and to uh, protect the rights of news gatherers. So that's why this issue is so very important today because, um, you know, back in the day when Christiane and I were in journalism school and the days when she was, um, you know, Jim was a young investigative reporter himself, um, news gathering in, in many respects was, was much simpler. I think there wasn't, um, there wasn't, the, uh, you know, trolling, there wasn't um, the, the constant, um, you know, the, the shows that you see sometimes, uh, whether they be broadcast or um, otherwise, where um, it's not news reporting, but it's, it's a series of, of um, you know, commentators. And I think when people um, watch news and they, they don't see, they don't understand the difference between having a group of people that are paid commentators, paid to put forth a uh, particular point of view. Um, that's a very different thing than, you know, when you would think about, you know, watching the, the, um, the evening news with, um, you know, any of the three major TV networks that were, um, back in the day in the golden age of journalism where they would, you know, present present the news, the evening news, 6.30 to 7, and it was um, a, a different sort of point of view. So when you think about, when you turn TV on today, and, and viewers need to understand this, that sometimes um, what you're watching is, is commentary, commentators, and their point of view should not be conflated with that these are, these are journalists presenting, um, um, you know, legitimate, um, truthful, not neutral type of reporting, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for uh, sharing all that. I didn't realize that you, I should have done the math, you were uh, with Christian at the, uh, at the same time. I do have a clip here about Jim and his work, so let's uh, show that uh, so that people can get a sense and then we will play a clip from after that we'll play a clip from christian and then we'll call it a night it's been a long day so let's uh take a look here one second i i'm going to find the uh the gym video first uh just a second all right here we go and as a young 20 something jim terracani was actually pursuing a career in music I was in college and uh bumming around with some bands and hopefully to make this is back in the 70s and was trained on classical trumpet he figured radio might be a good fallback career jim joined the channel 10 news department in 1979 as a general assignment reporter covering snowstorms and other day-to-day -day events when investigative reporter paul giacobi left journalism to become a lawyer Jim took over that role, and many of his stories were about the Rhode Island mob and its leader, Raymond Ellis Patriarca. Patriarca's business, the National Cigarette Company on Atwell's Avenue, will most likely be run now by his partner, Sam Carosa. I just said dick any way. I this on videotape. I don't care. Well, if I did, I mean, I'll play it. I didn't mean it that way, all right? 
I didn't mean it. What did you mean? We saw Jim's confrontational but fact-based interviewing style during his investigation of illegal waste dumping in Coventry, Johnston, and elsewhere in the 80s, with the mob getting a cut of the dumping fees. Other stories included the flow of illegal immigrants from Guatemala to Rhode Island and the illegal sale of black market guns. Jim left NBC10 in 1995 to pursue a new career as press secretary to the newly elected Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Almond. Disgruntled by politics, Jim was back at NBC10 about two years later and dealt with a personal medical need, the need for a new heart. After a heart transplant, he got right back into circulation and a year or two after that, investigated and then became part of the Plunderdome corruption investigation. Jim released a secret undercover videotape of a top CNC administration official accepting a bribe. Federal Judge Ernest Torres called it an unpleasant task, sentencing a reporter that he has admired for many years. But he said what was at stake was the rule of law, which was violated. In December of 2004, I-Team reporter Jim Terracani was sentenced in federal court to four months home confinement for refusing to say who gave him a tape showing a top CNC administration official taking a bribe. The sentence ended on April 9th in 05. I'm sure it's better than being in prison, but uh, it's not something you wanna do. Jim spent the next few years doing something he did wanna do, lobby the federal government for a reporter shield law to prevent what happened to him from happening to other reporters. Jim spent nine more years heading the I team until his retirement in 2014. Wow, what does it make you feel seeing that? Again, I know we you've seen it so many times. We've played it on this show before. What are your thoughts? First of all, <laughs> he looks so young, you know, back in the 80s, and it, it's amazing how, um, you know, that the the stories that he covered back then were are are just as legitimate and germane and relevant, and his style of of confronting. Um, confronting wrongdoing uh, is very much, um, you know, relevant today. And those stories were really important. And people remember them, you know, the whole issue of waste dumping um, and polluting the reservoir and, you know, things that people never, never really understood. So those stories, those investigative stories were his, were his trademark. And again, if you think about it back in the 80s, um, uh, where there wasn't 24-hour news and there wasn't this uh, a nonstop, um, um, you know, news reporting and and the like. So this was very much um, a very solid way to um, approach some of the the really sticky and difficult um, situations here in Rhode Island. So he did a great job with all that, and you know, people trusted him, and that was one of the aspects um, that we talked about. You know, after his passing where people would say, you know, we knew that Jim was on our side and he was, uh, he was, um, he was truthful, not neutral. And just like Christian, and he, he knew when he was being snowed and he was able to suss that out uh, and be able to um, show people what corruption looked like. And that's why, you know, that videotape um, that we, that you just showed of, of that individual in City Hall taking a bribe, you could see it so very, very, very clearly there that the individual just, you know, took the envelope and quietly put it in the drawer. Uh, but the power of video to be able to to show that to and he, and Jim felt very strongly that it was important to show people what corruption looked like. And I would dare to say that if it weren't for the fact that it was captured on an undercover videotape, people would be skeptical that that you know, it didn't really happen, you know, couldn't possibly have done that. You know, these kinds of things don't happen, but where you see it right there on the videotape and taking it, putting it, and that was the, the heart of the, the government's case that in fact there was a racketeering enterprise going on within within City Hall there. Uh, and I equate that as well with um, what we were talking about earlier with Christian about the video of the George Floyd uh, killing. And um, we've seen not just with George Floyd, but with other, uh, with other instances uh, where individuals were in fact uh, mistreated and, and killed and brutalized in a very unfortunate uh, way that we wouldn't have seen it and we wouldn't have appreciated it and we wouldn't have necessarily believed it if it were in fact um, there in um, 
full video for people to digest, to re, you know, to rewind, to look at it again, and um, and I think that's that presents a bit of a turning point. And, and Christiane was saying, you know, at, you know, we've been fighting these fights of of injustice for so long, over a hundred years, and but she believes that this time it's going to be different. And part of that reason is because of the ability for all of us to be able to see with our own eyes what in fact uh, may have been hidden in the shadows and that people with their own set of biases, unconscious bias, and we all have unconscious bias, even if we think we don't, we all do. And um, seeing it for ourselves and being able to uh, appreciate it for what it is and the atrocity of what it is is really what's going to make the difference so um, video uh, video is so important in terms of you know seeing is believing that's also an, another thing that um, you, you know we've definitely learned along the way we certainly, we have. certainly have and, and thank you Lori uh, now I'm going to play a clip of uh, Christian, this was uh, towards the end where I asked her what gives her hope. Uh, Nick Kristoff has written a column this week about hope and why we should be hopeful. So let's uh, take a listen to this clip about being hopeful. Let me ask you about hope. What gives you hope through this crisis as we're trying to handle all of this? So I'm an inveterate optimist and I'm not a blind optimist, but I, I do believe uh, you have to stay hopeful because it also requires, again, responsibility to fulfill that hope. You can't just sit and be hopeful and, you know, be an ostrich with your head in the sand and be hopeful that it's all going to work out. But hope is very important because hope is what kept Nelson Mandela alive in jail. Hope is what keeps people like Greta Thunberg, you know, uh, going and all the people who come to her, uh, the young people who come to her climate activism and have really shown the world what, what you can do on a street level. Hope is what keeps Black Lives Matter alive and, and what keeps, I think, hope. Hope is, is maybe the connective tissue along with action that can connect protest on the street to policy in the halls of power. You have to be able to have both those things working together. And I, I guess I am hopeful always because even in the worst of times, you see the best qualities of individuals. And I've seen that, you know, in the trenches. I've seen it in war zones. I've seen it amongst, you know, children, women, old men, civilians who've been targeted, who had nothing to do with the war, who are not military and who are nonetheless targeted, kept up their humanity, kept up their dignity, kept up their struggle for, for freedom and for justice. And, and I think individuals have, have proven that hope is a massive and important ingredient in moving the ball of justice and progress forward. Thank you. And uh, with that, we will uh, give Laurie a chance to give us her final thoughts and we'll say good night. I also want to tell Laurie that uh, I'm hoping she'll pass on to Christian a, a fun moment from earlier today. Uh, as I've, I've, as I said to many of you, we've had a long day here at DigiMentors, my company. And Laurie, sorry, you're kind of visible. So just warning, yeah, you can hide or you can put your head, there you go. Uh, so this was my day. I started at noon uh, interviewing with you, Christian Amanpour, and then our team produced these, this terrific interview with the CEO of New York Public Radio, WNYC, on the show that we do for Meryl Brown and Alex Leo at the News Project. And you can find that, I tweeted that out at 6 p.m. And then at 8 p.m., we'd have this amazing evening with uh, Steve Van Zant from the East Street Band and from The Sopranos and from Lillehammer on Netflix and Drew Carey, uh, the, t the, the, the comedian and TV host and activists and musicians from Cleveland. So this is a road show that we're doing with uh, Steve and uh, and so Drew Carey when I told him that I got a jet because I'm doing this project with Christian uh, He said please tell her that I'm a huge fan and all I wanted to do was Be her cameraman when he was younger and that's what he wanted to do so I think she would get a kick out of uh, hearing that I hope and uh, uh, This is uh, something that he told me just 
That's amazing. Uh, just love everything about that. Great stories. So, so let's give you a chance to say goodnight and then I will uh, wrap up the evening. Just tagging on to what Christian said about hope. Um, hope is, is something that isn't just um, um, a thought or a feeling that is out there for things that, that are happening in the world. And hope is what keep, pe keeps people alive. It's hope is what keeps people um, well. It has, it's what keeps people's mental health um, um, in, a, in a very good place. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's some, it's a little thing. It seems like a little thing, but it's really a big thing. And I love the idea that we can each, um, each of us as individuals can express hope on not just the big political items of our day, political agenda items, the big civic um, things that impact us all as, um, as members of society, whether it be on the local level, international level, whether it's presidential politics or what's happening at City Hall or, you know, the Greta Thunberg movement on climate change or any one of a, um, a number of issues, Black Lives Matter. Um, there are just so many issues that are out there that sometimes we all become, you know, feeling a bit overwhelmed, like what can we do as, as citizens to be able to, um, to be able to, to understand these issues and to weigh in. Uh, and also just, you know, little things like how do we keep ourselves well and how do we keep ourselves, um, you know, physically and mentally fit in order to continue to, to fight this pandemic and to continue to fight uh, so many issues, so many serious, serious matters that are out there that are affecting our, our planet, our people, um, and our, our families and the like. Uh, but we can hold on to hope. And if we hold on to hope, I think... Um, we will all be able to be there for one another and to be able to help one another, learn from one another, and be a resource and um, a safe place for one another. So at the very root of everything that we are as individuals, you know, we can really hold on to, to hope and let that guide us. Thank you so much, Laurie. We'll say good night to you. And uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll have you back uh, when we do our third episode in about a month of the Tarakani Lecture Series on the First Amendment. So thank you very much, Lori, and we'll say good night. And uh, thank you all for watching. At this point is when we do our Say Their Names. I was interviewing the great Kimberly Crenshaw, the, uh, the Columbia Law professor who coined the term intersectionality. And she said, uh, when I asked her, what can we do as allies, she said, say their names. So I'm going to say their names. Before that, I want to remind you what's coming up. We have tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern time, we have a show with two uh, friends from our, from Las Vegas. We're going to be here to talk about Vegas under COVID. Uh, Terry and Joyce will be here with us. Uh, that's also Apollo from Facebook, uh, who's always on our show. What's it like to live in a tourist city during COVID? Meet two former New York New Yorkers now living in Vegas. So that should be interesting. And then on Saturday morning, very early, we have a show about food and soil security with Dr. Ratan Lal, winner of the 2020 World Food Prize and professor of soil science at Ohio State University. I hope you'll be able to join us. It's very early on Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern because that evening I am uh, moderating a conversation between Fareed Zakaria and Anil Kapoor, the Bollywood star. Some of you know him from Slumdog Millionaire. He was a quiz show host on it. He was fantastic in that and of course fantastic in so many Bollywood films. So CNN's Fareed Zakaria and I are, um, are gonna be in conversation with him and with the CEO of Pratham, uh, one of India's great NGOs, uh, education uh, nonprofits, Pratham, uh, Rukmini Banerjee. So the three of us will be in conversation uh, it is open, you can register. It's their first virtual national gala and you can uh, join by going to prathamusa.org and signing up and uh, making sure you can get into that program. That's uh, Saturday night at 8 p.m. and that's why this show is live at 9 a.m. instead of uh, much later in the day. 
So now let me uh, do that part that we have promised to do. We have been saying their names. First, we were doing that with this Titus Kaffer cover on Time Magazine, where they ran the border of all these names, a stunning painting and the stunning photograph of a young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia. She would die two years, almost to the day before her son would be killed. And they're both buried next to each other in Houston. And uh, of course, uh, his, his death has not been in vain because so many people uh, have been moved and have learned and done so much and been moved to so much action. And uh, uh, so we are now reading their names, uh, thanks to our viewers for pointing us to names mentioned in the updated version of the Say Her Name report. These are women killed in, in uh, interactions with the police. Uh, Brianna Taylor killed by police in her bed on March 13, 2020. So I shall read their names. Tatiana Jefferson, Sherlina Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Pearlie Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kaim Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Cherise Francis, Ayana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, and Eleanor Bumpers. Every one of them had a story. Every one of them, their lives matter. And that's why we say their names. On the show, I've been well, for 127 days that we've been live here, I have watched in horror as America has failed at its most basic, basic rule, uh, rule of keeping its people safe. The American government has failed, and not just at the federal level, at the governor's level, in many cases, municipal and village level. And I've been very critical of America. And I that's one of my rights as an American to do this. I have sometimes my Indian friends who are uh, very careful about what they say uh, under almost any administration uh, are surprised by what Americans are able to say. And they say, you're an immigrant to America and you say these things. And that's what the First Amendment allows me to do. And I did want to say that this is also the same country that allowed me to produce a show with Lil Steven and Drew Carey. And so that tells you something about this country, that it's a great country that it allows you know, somebody whose father was born in a house with no electricity, mud walls in uh, faraway India, to be able to come to this country, uh, be educated in this country, and have, an op have opportunities. I'm very blessed to have those opportunities. I know I have them because I'm overeducated and I'm Indian. Other people of color do not have these opportunities, but still, this country lets me do this and have a day like I had today where I got to interview Christian Amanpour and got to talk to Silvio from The Sopranos or to talk to Drew Carey. And uh, that just tells you something awesome about this country. And we hold America to a higher standard than we hold other countries. And that's why I, on, on this show, every single day, talk about the failures of this country. And uh, it doesn't mean failures of the people, but the people who are trusting the wrong people. Today I tweeted that when someone said that the amount of people trusting the false information of this president, it's only 30%. I said, it's oh my God, it's 30%. And it's those 30% people who are going to get themselves killed and get us killed if we're not careful. And that's why accurate information matters. That's why science matters. 
That's why facts matter. That's why masks matter. And we all have an obligation to tell people that and, and fight for truth and the right side of history. And when the historians look back, if there is, if there are historians left to look back, one of the things that Christian said that I'll never forget, she said that the planet will survive, but it's us as a civilization that are in danger right now. And we have to be careful and we have to watch out. I thought it was the first time I'd heard anybody put it that starkly uh, and to her, hear her say it was very, very important. And my feeling is if someone of her stature and who works for a big uh, international company like CNN and, and like PBS can be outspoken about the truth, there's no reason why little old me on this little old show cannot be honest and not have to fake it the way a lot of journalists do. Uh, I was talking today to a journalist friend of mine who says that listen to reporters on some podcasts and they are so much more forthcoming about the, the severity of the problems we're facing because in their official newspapers, in their official accounts, they have to be a lot more whataboutisms and, uh, you know, both sideisms and things like that. And that's the place we're in now. So I decided not to sit on the sidelines uh, before the 2020. I said that this 2020 election is going to be the most important election of our lifetimes. And that was before the pandemic. And now it's even going to be more important. So we're going to focus on truth as we have for 127 days. And we're going to focus on learning and keeping an open mind. With that, I'm going to let you go. It's been an hour and a half show today. Uh, I'm so grateful to everyone who, who has watched, who's been with us, who supported us. Please email me and please ask questions. Please comment. I'm Sri at Sri.net. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to uh, have you watch our archives, youtube.com slash Sri.net, youtube.com slash Sri.net. A reminder of a couple of our shows that are coming up. She's on Call is coming up Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'd love for you to be with us. She's on call on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube, but there's also an Instagram account. So please check that out. Two surgeons telling you the truth and sharing information. We also have a fabulous show on Sunday. This New York Times read along. We've been reading the New York Times for five years out loud like crazy people. And Claire Smith is going to be our guest, the first woman inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame writer's wing. And she's a former New York Times columnist and current ESPN news editor and our friend Neil Parekh, executive producer, and will be guest hosting the show. Why guest hosting? Because I was supposed to be in Puerto Rico this weekend. We were going to go out there, but of course, we're not taking a chance. And why Vegas this weekend? Because my entire family and three members of my DigiMentors team were set to fly out to Vegas for a big conference this week. So I've been, Vegas has been on my mind and I, I, I want to see what's happening there. With that, we'll say thank you to everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of the show. Uh, please tell your friends. We're here almost, uh, we're here every day, usually around 9 p.m. Eastern time, and the next two shows coming up are going to be really important. We have on Friday, Vegas under COVID. Please join us as we talk to two former New Yorkers who live in Vegas, what's going on there, and then we'll talk about food and soil security with Dr. Ratan Lal, the winner of the 2020 World Food Prize and professor of soil science at the, at the Ohio State University. And I will say goodbye to all of you and say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for support. Please email me, sri at sri.net, if we can collaborate, if we can work on anything. And my DigiMentors social digital and virtual events companies at your service. We're happy to just chat with you. If you have a virtual event coming up or a event you're trying to cancel uh, or postpone, talk to us first anywhere in the world. We will talk to you and share with you our thoughts, what we've been learning from doing dozens a month. As you saw, we four, did four just today. With that, thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you soon.